Uh, are we, should we, should we get going? Is everyone here? So welcome everyone to the lecture series of the Catalyst uh, 2020. Uh, my name is Vahan Misakyan. I'm the Cass Gilbert uh, assistant professor here at the school. I'm curating, coordinating this event. Um, uh, I, I wanna start, expand on the topic and start with a simple notion of storytelling. Um, uh, the uh, idea that architects don't build is not radical, you know that. We, tell, we communicate ways to build, right? We tell stories about how to build, including amongst other things. So we, you could say if you ever fail to tell a story, a compelling story about what you do, you fail as an architect, right? So it's not that we are building things or even, even when we do, through the building, we're telling story about something larger. So storytelling is somewhat endemic to our profession. Um, and uh, um, the, the topic, uh, uh, architectures of reassurance, I wanna expand on that. Um, so you could say that all architecture ever does is reassure, right? It reassures that s systems run, that things stand, uh, uh, or that uh, uh, are, deeper level sort of uh, anxieties can be kept at bay, that anxieties about our own discontinuity. Architecture is there as an evidence of, of our civilized sort of enterprise going on and on, right? Or um, architecture reassures us of our own abstract idea of ourselves, right? It hides the material residue of our uh, uh, existence, like Mark Wigley's basic argument. Uh, it hides the pipelines, it hides the wires, right? It, it presents this idea of uh, stability. It reassures, essentially, that's one of the basic functions that architecture does, right, as a title. But uh, uh, the question for me is, okay, what, what is the status of architecture uh, in all of the conventional ways that we mean it during the time of, times of emergency or times of crisis? when you need more than just a built uh, articulation of control in order to reassure safety. You might need military apparatuses uh, embedding themselves within life uh, during pandemics, for example, or uh, during migrant crises. It's a type of crisis, 69, 65 million on record displaced today, one of the biggest uh, numbers. So these types of emergencies give rise to different architectures that reassure. Architectures that in their uh, uh, totality become controlling and become all-encompassing and totalitarian. So, uh, uh, and, and that's, that was one of the problems. So architectures being multiple, right? Plural, there are many, there's not just one. And the reassurance being the basic function of, that's why I chose the title. Um, and uh, I, I, I wanna go back to this very simple notion of storytelling, um, I'm gonna quote uh, 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 from Shoshana Zuba of Surveillance Capitalism, knowledge, authority, and power rest with surveillance capital for which we are nearly human nature, human natural resource. Uh, we are the uh, native peoples now whose claims to self-determination have vanished from the maps of our own experience. Uh, so I would sort of complicate her notion of surveillance capitalism is the surveillance communism uh, better. So, this, and also the notion of surveillance, the way I mean it is not necessarily the oversight, but the, the idea of legibility. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation when there's this extreme asymmetry of legibility, this uh, military infrastructures, phones, uh, private companies know more about us than we know about them. There's this different regimes of legibility. And storytelling can uh, explicate, it can tell uh, to the public a kind of, it can expand a kind of legibility. In that way, it can play with the notion of power. So this is why our speakers today are very interesting and compelling to hear. Both of them are very compelling storytellers, I think. And both of their stories are dealing with power relationships, uh, notions of legibility, um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll, uh, so today we'll basically have two short lectures, first by Theo Deutinger, and then by Gerga Basic, and then we, uh, along with uh, Gabriel Quillar, will moderate it. 
Um, so uh, just to quickly introduce, Theo uh, is an architect, writer, and designer uh, of socio-cultural studies, I'm quoting. He is a founder and head of TD Architects. His uh, book, Handbook of Journey, uh, published in 2018, has won numerous awards. Uh, uh, he exhibited his work in Storefront for Architecture in New York uh, and uh, Venice Biennale in 2014. Uh, so a lot of venues in which your stories have been disseminated. So it'd be fascinating to see uh, what you tell us today. And Gerga Basic is an uh, associate researcher, scholar at the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes uh, and an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. His work research focuses on critical narrative and inv investigative cartography. And I think he's one of the emerging voices in this field. So um, it'd be exciting to see. Uh, his uh, story as well. And Gabriel Quillar, as uh, we teach here, as, as you know, as uh, he is uh, an architect, co-director of Cadaster, uh, uh, a collective engaged with territorial matters and the pervasive structures that make up urban conditions. Uh, Cadaster has, has been awarded the Architectural League Young Architects Prize. And uh, with that, we'll start with Thea. Help me welcome our first guest. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have uh, the lecture is in two parts. First, a little bit of, um, yeah, overview of my theoretical um, illust yeah, illustration work and then about the handbook uh, of tyranny, uh, public publication from 2018. Um, I have an endless lectures somehow prepared, so I will time it because I could talk probably for, for two hours. <laughs> so, yeah, starting now. Um, yes, okay. No. Yeah, of course. Um, just an, an, an overview. I mean, the first part of the lecture is called Snapshots of Globalization. Um, that's a, a, a term I gave to the theoretical work of mine, which deals with, uh, with large-scale analysis, and large-scale is, is global analysis. And um, I'm very fascinated with, with globalization, the, the, the later period of globalization, which uh, is the last 500 years. Um, and in these 500 years, a lot of things happened, a lot of events happened. Uh, also, the profession of architecture uh, changed a lot. This is the, let's say, a timeline of uh, the last, last 500 years in, in architecture, um, starting with the Renaissance man. And one of the, the most famous of Renaissance men is, is, uh, was Leonardo da Vinci. And this is from an architect's point of view. Uh, that first there was the architect, and then a lot of other professions just split off. First the landscaper, then the engineer, the writer, the planner, restorer, the restorator, designer. Oops. And finally, we have then the model maker, of course. And, and yeah, all of these professions, maybe they, maybe they even more, are now uh, spring off from from uh, uh, yeah from from architects. So um, yeah, we have the graphic designer, web designer. Uh, uh, quality here, we have the, all the, the engineer, let's say the civil engineer, traffic engineer, and so on and so on, uh, which is now somehow atomized uh, the profession of architect. If you want to be a an, an real, real architect, you would have to be uh, all of this together. Um, but since this is almost not possible anymore, 
it is a kind of a whole potpourri um, of, of professions. Um, I just go through, through work and thoughts I have. Uh, the other thing I have, if we, if you, if we, if we are um, very diverse in our, let's say, appearance, so we are a whole army of, uh, of people, um, we are also kind of um, diverse in our, in our thinking, but somehow I have this feeling what, what I, this is one of the snapshots of globalization uh, we are making in the office, which deals with uh, globalization as, a, as, a phenom as the phenomenon of bringing people together, as bringing people together from all around the world, and as kind of um, learning from each other and also kind of uh, thinking about uh, architecture as a, as a profession which um, should be a global profession. I mean, I'm very European uh, educated. I learned the classical columns, uh, the Greek, the, Do uh, the, the Doric, Dorish, Ionish, Corinthish, and Composite. Yeah, if the four, if the composite is the fourth one, uh, and this is this classical column uh, scheme, which you actually are, are, at least I was educated, not knowing that so many other columns are existing in the world and so many other cultures develop columns. So why are we reduced to these four columns in a time of globalization? While we could, if we are truly uh, um, let's say global citizens or, or world citizens, we should have a column scheme. We should learn all of these columns. We should be educated by the, uh, with the Japanese um, Maya columns. Um, yeah, a global column um, potpourri. Um, and what changed in these 500 years particularly is our notion of space. So this is one of the first kind of maps, it's not drawn, it's not an original, but it was described by Eratosthenes, a Greek uh, philosopher and uh, science, science, uh, scientist, which was a yeah, scientist, who described this map and people drew it after his description. So that was kind of the antique world, the known world for the, for the Greek people at that time which is somehow that part of the world, if you would project it on, on what we know today. And from that moment, let's say from uh, 200 before, before Christ till, let's say, uh, 500 years ago, the, the image of the world uh, and of, of the earth changed enormously. So this was somehow um, yeah, a map from 1664, uh, we are already, let's say, 150 years in the new phase of globalization. Uh, what I like about this map is how we uh, projected our kind of description of the world, like the old world and the new world, onto the map. So these were two almost planets which met here and which started from that time on to merge. Uh, and even linguistically, we don't distinguish today anymore between the old and the new world. But for a long time, this was the new world because it was like discovering a completely new, new planet. Uh, you can see that it was not fully discovered. So here are some parts of Australia missing. Alaska is completely missing. It was also called the new and most accurate world uh, map at that time. Um, yeah, and this is somehow an, an index of an overview what, what uh, fascinates me about this uh, time of, of globalization. So this is Magellan, which I think um, heralded a new, a new period of globalization, the, the, the last phase we are in or the latest phase we are in, with bringing back the evidence that the world is a sphere, so that we li live on a, on, a, on a globe. And throughout this... Uh, 500 years, several steps of global, globalization happened. Like territory, we mapped 
the, the world, communication uh, with the invention of the telegraph products, uh, the World Fair, sports, the introduction, reintroduction of the Olympics, international style in architecture, United Nations in politics, pop culture, and so on. So we are kind of within these 500 years, we got to know each other. We somehow unified the world in different steps. This was for me one of the most important steps. 1884 in Washington, the International Meridian Conference. Uh, at that conference, the zero meridian through Greenwich was uh, defined and the time zones were defined. So what I think is that what happened at this conference, uh, the world was turned into an Excel sheet. So it was just clearly the world turned into somehow in a device. The, the funny thing is I didn't want to show this slide because I thought it doesn't fit so well, but I, I was arriving yesterday um, and my last flight was from uh, Chicago to here and I looked out of the window and I, I thought, Jesus, I always make this metaphor about the world as an Excel sheet, but I thought it more as a metaphor of, of we can plot anything on this Excel sheet. It just depends very much on, on the resolution. Uh, if you look, if you very much zoom into, um, sorry, into Google Earth, then you have pixels, you find pixels. So our digital building blocks are these pixels, but that they really exist in, uh, yeah, in reality, it's, it was fascinating to see, to fly for hour, almost an hour over an yeah, Excel sheet. Um, yeah, even here, I also checked this then in Google Maps. It looks very interesting because you even have the, the numbers here. Um, yeah, that's Wisconsin, <laughs> apparently. So, and this is somehow, this Excel sheet is somehow the base of, of this uh, research. And I'm fascinated how we rationally always try to, to redesign and reconquer the world in different ways. This is, for example, uh, the Earth divided uh, in, in uh, flight information regions, so uh, even the it's, it's the, the space above the ground, so where, where airplanes are flying, is divided in, this, in these regions. The United States have one of the largest uh, flight information regions because, um, yeah, with several islands, uh, owning several islands, it's quite a, quite a big stretch of land. Um, yeah, this is... Um, uh, how do you say, maintaining. You, you maintain this, this uh, space by air, air traffic control. What is interesting about um, the architecture of rear insurance, I mean, it's, it, it's all about safety and, and it's very bureaucratic. This whole space, anyway, our, our whole life is very bureaucratic, but also this space is a very bureaucratic space. What happens is that when you leave an airspace, uh, a flight information region, you have to say goodbye, for example, here to Malaysia, say hello to Vietnam. So it's always kind of saying goodbye, hello, whenever you, you, you go in and out of a region. This was an, an event happened in 2014, uh, the flight MH370, uh, who disappeared in the Indian Ocean. And what this pilot did, he said goodbye to Singapore and never said hello to Vietnam. So the, he never um, yeah, introduced the whole airplane to Vietnam, to the Vietnam flight information region. That's why the plane just got off the radio, radio, radio and, and got lost. I mean, much later they discovered that the, there was an airplane who never said hello to him. So it, it never... Usually what we said today about there is a transition when you cross a border, you always, there is a little moment where you are in a somehow no man's land and it's even in airspace like that. If you don't say hello to the, yeah, to the next space you enter, there is a possibility like this one, which was one time 
event um, uh, that you disappear. And here, a whole uh, airplane disappeared. So there are uh, borders. I mean, here are borders which are invisible. So and, and borders and division of land is not always very, very visible. Um, this is a, a, a snapshot we made already the first time in 2008. Um, the world world, which shows the Western world compared to the rest. You could say the West and the rest. This was based on um, a book from Peter Sloterdijk, a German philosopher. The book is called the, uh, in, the world of interior, uh, in the World Interior of Capital, where he described, based on Dostoevsky's book, the Western world as a crystal palace. And uh, he said, he wrote in this book that at certain moments, the walls of this crystal palace are appearing. And I tried to trace these fragments of these walls. And kind of this is somehow this crystal palace we are living in, um, where we are, have life insurance, um, and so on and so on. And, and yeah, complain about temperature rising in the, in the uh, palace. And we want to have an uh, air conditioning that it doesn't get so warm and so on. Could go on like that, but this was somehow the, initiation, the, the initial uh, idea appeared that there are architectures, uh, especially here, and real architecture like walls, which are there just to, to separate us, to separate. Um, so these are anti, the architecture against globalization and against the un unification movement uh, of mankind. That was somehow the base of the Handbook of Tyranny. And the Handbook of Tyranny tells, tells a story of, of man or humankind, technology, uh, and space. So this is somehow the reach of the pre-modern uh, pre man uh, with spears and stone. So this is somehow the range we we, we have, it's maximum 400 meter, uh, 500 meter. And this is the, the range of uh, men with modern technology. So a sniper can, there's the, the record of uh, a Canadian sniper killing a, a Afghan a Taliban uh, is by 3,500 meters. So in the ground section, you see um, the different this makes in terms of um, area. You don't calculating in square kilometers, but you can imagine, I mean, it's one square kilometer, and this is almost 40 square kilometer. One soldier alone can defend and conquer. So this changed a lot in uh, terms of man in relation to, to space. And this change also led to several inventions, like this is, for example, the invention of the passport, uh, we celebrate the passport now uh, 100 years. It was invented or introduced into the national passport 1920. So it's a very young uh, invention. It's, it's our, was our idea to have a passport. In the beginning, it was also not considered as a very important idea. Now the passport is almost deciding between life and death. And it opens different spaces to the world. So if you have a US passport, you can enter 157 countries without applying for a visa. So this is the US size of the US world, which you can access right now at this moment without asking somebody if you are allowed to enter the other space. So this is the US world. Uh, and even also, this is my world, Austria. So I'm not so disadvantaged, just one country less. But um, and this is this, you are born into a country. You are, uh, we are just born into the United States, and you are born into this space. Um, but some other people are born into completely different spaces. Like if you are born into the Afghan space, you are uh, allowed to visit 22 countries uh, without a visa, and none of them um, is a neighboring country. Um, so it's actually just an island. Um, um, there, and you are landlocked in a way. 
Uh, another chapter in the book is Walls and Fences. The book has uh, uh, 12 chapters. And in the chapter Walls and Fences, there are all wall typologies and uh, fence and barrier typologies which separate nation states at the moment. So no historical uh, references, only that one uh, as, as an introductory picture, but um, they exist, these are all existing and functioning walls. These are all uh, barriers which separate the United States from Mexico. So these are vehicle barriers, these are fences, and these are walls at the moment. So it's a very diverse mixture of barriers between the two countries. And these walls, if we talk about architecture of reassurance, get continuously tested and um, yeah, uh, climbed. So there's continuous battle between the wall climbers and the wall uh, erectors. So these are new prototypes asked by, these are six from the eight uh, prototypes uh, which were erected uh, in, um, yeah, uh, for, for the President Trump, who is here, always in front of his wall. Um, here also the costs. Yeah, he's on site visiting. Um, so there's a continuous battle between building and climbing and so on. So there's also an, a, a certain moment, if it would be not so tragic, but a certain moment of, of joy also and playfulness, as you wrote, by uh, climbing these structures. Uh, the most extreme uh, version of wall we found so far is between Egypt and Gaza, which is a, um, a steel wall, which is 18 meter deep and eight meter high. It should prevent smugglers from, from digging tunnels. It was not a very successful wall. During uh, construction, it was already um, uh, dismantled because it was very easy to, with torches, with uh, hot torches to, to just cut the, the steel. Uh, but Israel is reacting. I mean, now it's actually Israel learned from this uh, wall and apparently there's a wall in, or it is uh, under construction. It's just not sure how deep this wall will be. Uh, it's believed that it will be 100 meter deep. If it would be that deep, it would be an enormous structure, um, which would be, um, yeah, just a, like an iceberg where a little fence is on top, but the main structure is underneath. And this is an overview of all um, the walls which are at the moment existing. At, at the moment means 2017, as we researched it with several countries who enclosed themselves already, like each, uh, Israel is only missing a, a small piece, or a small piece, but a, a piece between uh, Jordan and Israel, and then it would be completely fenced in uh, country. The interesting thing is, or interesting and tragic thing, is that all this wall building hype really started just after the fall of, Ber of the Berlin Wall, the moment when the world was celebrating that the end of wall building and the end of uh, separating countries by walls was actually the starting point uh, of uh, the global uh, wall building and separation. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's one, one more, just one more uh, chapter, uh, which is actually good because it's becoming even more architectonical. It's, it's interesting that also, this scalelessness, what I talked in the beginning, uh, or which I talk in my studio a little bit about, where, where we compare the United States with a room, that actually the, 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 the relation between nation states changes, but also, and, and wall building activities are there on, on a large scale, but also our cities change and become more and more fortified. And there's a continuous urge to, to control the crowds, to um, secure our cities. And this is, for example, uh, New York, which I can have some slides now where we walk through uh, 
the city to lower Manhattan. This is um, close to uh, ground zero. It's called now, how is it called? Uh, not ground zero. World One world. <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah tra exactly. World Trade Center. So yeah, I mean, it's um, heavily secured and surveilled, surveilled space. This is uh, close to Wall Street. Financial Center. Yeah, where you have kind of entrance gates, which are very similar to um, um, checkpoints between countries. So this is very, this could be also a border crossing or an entry point between two countries, between maybe Mexico and US, where you have a, uh, let's say, a wedge which goes down, you have to park your car in the middle, a bomb sniffing dog so, um, checks the car. If you are clear, you can, the next um, kind of wedge is lowered and you can continue inside. So it's very uh, secured space. And there is also um, a design which doesn't even have a physical appearance. This is how the police Controls, uh, controls crowds, so without even materializing uh, or just mat by materializing as persons or, uh, let's say, um, taking a shape as a, as, as, as a person. So these are all police men just forming a wedge. So by forming a wedge, they can separate a crowd or by forming a line, they can kettle a crowd or can kind of push a crowd to the left or to the right. So design does not always materialize in a, in a physical form, but can also be in a kind of almost choreography or dance. Yeah, no, now I want to actually. Here you see a, a kettling, example of kettling. Oh, three, 33 seconds, I'm very good. Um, yeah, uh, this is an example of, of kettling. I just want to, um, show you that, it's the kind of, uh, um, that's this, with the help of a, of a net, the police kind of kettle uh, protesters. And here I go into the example of de dematerializing uh, completely. This is an LRAD device, which is a ultrasonic, uh, very high pitch noise device, which is a sound cannon, and which is more and more, um, Crowd control goes in the direction of non-physical crowd control because of social media and, and so on. This is not very good for police to have images like that on social media. So police tries to more and more go in the direction of crowd control, which is not, uh, which you cannot capture, capture on video or on uh, photo. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, so um, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about um, a project. It's a data data-driven multimedia project um, that reveals the way that canners, so people who collect cans and bottles um, for living, experience the city. And so to keep this presentation contact, I'll um, talk about the cartog narrative and critical cartography uh, by going under the hood uh, with this project. 
Um, so I worked with the journalist Francesca Berardi uh, for about a year on this. And uh, we were based in Bushwick, and we work with, um, with the, in a redemption, at the Redemption Center um, and with the, with the community of canners there. Um, so as I said, canners are those who supplement their income uh, by, and or pensions by picking up um, cans and bottles for redeemable value. Um, and some of them actually make a living and pay their rent uh, by canning. So I'm walking outside of my house one day and I... Um, sorry, I need to make sure that the... You guys can hear this. One second. So, I'm all right. Once. It's a little bit too loud. Here? Oh, okay. Okay. Just don't want to. So I'm walking outside of my house one day and I see all these cans and bottles and these blue bags and I said, wow. <laughs> but I said, oh man, I can't be picking up <laughs> no bottles and cans. I got time for that. And I says, wait a minute, look at all. I says, I can't ignore this. So it took me a little while to kind of get my nerve up. But when I finally did, I got a shopping cart and I says, you know what, I don't give a damn what anybody thinks. This is money and I'm going to get it. So to date, we don't really know how many canners there are. There's no such thing as a census of canners or any like concrete survey. Um, so much of what is known about canners is uh, what we found out from canners themselves. Um, and so um, Redemption Center owners that are interviewed for this project estimate that there is about 10,000 people in New York um, who can every day or you know, most of, as, as their primary um, activity or job. Um, but that we, we're unable to verify that number. Um, so there's like a whole host of reasons why New Yorkers can, uh, but you know, common reasons are unemployment, um, inability to work um, due to like probably old age or immigrant status. Um, and so for many elderly canners, it's actually, um, means of contributing to their households um, and staying active. And so only few are actually homeless or struggling with addiction. So this project is about um, mapping experiences of eight of them. Um, so as I said, over the course of a year, um, my friend and collaborator, fr journalist Francesca Berardi, uh, followed the group of um, canners in their daily activities. Uh, and collective all kinds of qual qualitative and quantitative um, in information about their work. And so that information comes in multiple forms. It comes in forms of interviews, handwritten notes, sketches, photos, videos, and GPS tracks of their itineraries. And so this project combines um, all these practices, so oral history interviews, data collection, visualization, critical cartography, and illustration into um, immersive web, web, web experience. Um, so we were, we were aiming for a, like a co-owned narrative. We really wanted to work with canners and have them own this narrative. Um, and so giving us, giving them a voice and platform to talk, uh, we were able to look beyond just their activity on the streets and actually know who the, learn who these people are. Okay, the idea that this is, this, this stuff that we're doing with the kids is child's play, it's just not true. People can literally pay their rent. So, um, 
Uh, we engaged with illustration. We actually, like Francesca, actually had to learn how to draw for this project because uh, we were, we, you, you can't just like go to a canner and start waving with a camera. Um, they don't like that. Um, and illustration is a lot more intrusive tool. And so they were open to sort of uh, work with us <coughs> if they were not photographed. Um, and so we had to resort to um, this sort of like um, imaginary tool. Um, and so critical to our storytelling approach um, is this act of mapping that goes much further than trying to mirror reality. Um, so we were, we instead we developed this highly um, curated concept of mapping uh, spatial patterns of Kenner's activities. Uh, it was grounded within empirical data, but totally um, interpretive. And so we call it critical cartography, um, which by definition is a, um, mapping practice grounded in critical theory, uh, specifically the thesis that um, maps reflect and perpetuate relations of power, uh, typically in favor of society's dominant group. And so the practical application of critical cartography is also known as counter mapping. And so this is a counter mapping project and our aim was to develop a form in which we were redrawing the city um, in the image of Kenner's daily lives. So which brings me to this main question that this project is trying to answer is like, what does the city look like uh, through the lens of canners? I know that if I walk this way in the morning and go this far, hey, I can get $25. I know if I take it another block, I can get $30. I know if I go down to Grand Street, in South and North First Street, I can get $50. I know that if I go two blocks beyond that, that's another six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars So before I show you all that, I just want to step back and take a moment and describe the series of steps um, that we follow to go from a non-mapped data set um, to this final mapped form. And I'll start with, um, with cartographic process. Um, and so um, Dennis Cosgrove, uh, in his book, um, Geography and Vision, uh, recognized mapping as a complex cultural process in which map represents just one stage. And so we could draw that as a cycle that, um, that starts with um, real of or imagined environment. So what we see there as ground. Um, and then uh, the first step of the process is survey, right? I talked about survey today with my group, um, mapping group, uh, but survey is a field-based activity. So it's a direct collection and production of spatial data to be represented or mapped. And so as map maker or surveyor um, collects data from the environment, either through technology, remote sensing, or, in, or any other um, you know, apparatus, um, they use their perception to detect spatial patterns, right? And so, and prepare data for uh, mapping and map creation. And historically, there's been a shift, obviously, from like individual human body as a reliable agent for data collection to instrumentalization, right? Today, we use satellite images, uh, remote sensing, um, other remote sensing techniques, and machine learning to uh, actually create um, to, for survey. Um, and then map maker is the one who decides what data sets and features to combine into a single representation or map, right? And so here we, we, have, our, we have hierarchies and arguments. So we want to we wanna emphasize certain things uh, in, through general, general, generalization and symbolization. And so what, what features on a map are there to provide context and what features on a map are ca causally related, uh, what is there to just provide some sort of background, right? Um, and next, the map user uh, is the one who reads, analyzes, and interprets uh, the map by decoding the symbol uh, they found on a map and recognizing those patterns, right? Um, and finally, uh, map users make decisions and take actions based upon what they found on a map. 
um, and maps in that way influence our spatial behavior um, and also our spatial preferences and ultimately shape how we view the environment, right? And so it's common for each of these phase in that cycle to be executed separately and it's also common um, for us, not just separately in terms of like different people, but different groups of people and different, different um, uh, institutions. Um, so for example, as, as designers and who oftentimes make maps, we are, we're always stuck in that second quadrant in which like we are dependent on data that is like collected by some opaque sources that we don't really know uh, much about, right? Um, and, um, and like maybe we also have the agency over deciding what to do with the, uh, with the ground as as um, as uh, policy experts by taking someone else's map, reading it, and making decisions upon that. But it's very rare that we are engaged in each of these um, in each of these processes. So for this project in particular, it was important for us to take agency over the whole process and to engage with each aspects of, of this cartographic project, right? So we wanted to execute each of these stages. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about survey. And so survey for us was very simple. Uh, we did not use a lot of uh, fancy uh, survey equipment. All we had was um, reporter's notebook. This is, this is literally what Francesca had. Um, and we use an iPhone. Um, um, to generate GPS tracks of Canner's itineraries. And so that's the, that was the survey. Um, and then, then came the encoding. So all those um, notes were then carefully transcribed, um, translated from Italian to English. And, and then we were sort of like re, rewriting them until we started noticing patterns in, what we, in, 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 all, in all those notes. And so, as you can see, like through this text, we started like redraw, like we started like so, um, we started to observe patterns that were emerging. So everything that was happening could somehow fall into three or four categories, like whether it's a collection, whether it's a meeting, or whether it's an observation. And so we started redrawing these and rewriting these, and we had like a rule that each moment in on a map can only have hundred and. 40 characters, whereas, which I thought was the Twitter uh, max allowed character. So we thought that maybe like we're used to that kind of short uh, summary. Um, and then once that those patterns became clear and where every point had a, cl a class or a category, um, we designed what those points might be. And then, um, and so that's the design part of the cartographic process. And finally, we have compilation. Uh, when we're using symbology, we translated those notes into maps that are precise but also completely disorienting. And so we've placed the itineraries on a blank background where like geographical features that we're used to see on a map completely disappear. So there's no street names, no park names, no bodies of water, no building footprints, nothing. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The first reason was that we wanted to protect Kenner's privacy. So um, each Kenner moves along a very specific route at specific time uh, with very precise objectives, right? Um, and so the, and the competition in New York City is high, even among Kenners. So uh, they're very protective of their relationship that they have with superintendents of buildings or where they have to be at certain hours. Uh, and so we wanted to respect that. So we did not want to reveal exactly where they can, but we wanted to be very precise about the route. So that's why we removed all the geographical features that could, um, that could um, reveal the actual geolocation. Um, and also like for superintendents, like um, you can't really indicate where there's a super who's ready to open uh, the, the basement in exchange for like um, something, you know, that might have uh, raise controversies. Um, and then so we've unrolled these paths. And so we rendered the city not in this like conventional Cartesian space of north, south, east, and west, but we completely redraw the paths. It's this sort of wandering ground in the image of Kenner's daily rhythms. And lastly, yeah. Um, We created these itineraries that are at the same time a map 
but also a timeline. There's a couple of examples of these. And then we turned, into, in, turned those drawings into user experiences um, so that like a user can, as the user scrolls on a website, the path reveals itself along this line. And so this is the home page um, of the project, and this is the only moment in which um, uh, the user can compare the path and where they exist in a sort of geographical space, uh, because we wanted to have this line of comparison between multiple canners. Um, but again, in order to protect privacy, the north is not up. We rotated it, we mirrored it, so even if you knew exactly which redemption center they're going to, you wouldn't be able to know where those paths are. Um, uh, we used ve very little um, photography, only uh, you know, when we thought it was important as a reporting tool. Um, but we never revealed um, canners themselves. Um, and because we, uh, Francesca was volunteering for about a year in the Redemption Center, we had exclusive access to their data uh, and so we knew exactly how much canners were making uh, each month because um, her job was to log in those da that data. Um, so that's also available. The day I went canning with Morena was July 31st. We met in the early morning, around 7 a.m. in Bushwick. The sky was clear. We were expecting a pretty hot day. As soon as we start walking, first thing I noticed is that Morena carries on a conversation with the whole street. Hola, papito. ¿Cómo she está? greets everyone. Hola, she hola. comments on the behavior of the passerby, she smiles, and if she sees someone she recognizes, she stops to chat. Hola, mi amor. Just wanted to include that for the end so you can hear also Francesca's voice. Um, yeah, that was it. Okay, it's on. Well, me and Gabriel will be the representation of your curiosity for our guests. So we, each of us, will just ask one or two questions to them, but then hopefully they will ignite a set of questions that you would have. If no, we will keep going, but the idea is that we want to ignite some sort of curiosity in you. Maybe, maybe you should start with your question um, for both of them. And I, I have one question for both of them. Um, yeah, I saw a lot of uh, amazing uh, overlap, but also different approaches um, of, of thinking about cartography and what is being mapped and, and the process that you go through. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, I think uh, my first uh, kind of uh, comment or question would be directed towards Theo. Um, in relation to... Um, this kind of ground, which is very present in, in, your, in your work, um, which was actually absent in, in Gurga's uh, mapping, which was the kind of, the geography was absent in, in Gurga's case. But Theo, in your, in your maps, um, the kind of underlying nation state architecture is very much part of that. But at the same time, you always, or not always, but seem to be um, trying to see the globe, the entire globe or the entire planet as the kind of field of your work and that the planet is kind of the site 
the entire planet and phenomena that is planetary in its in its scope. And I'm just uh, wondering if how how you think about that and how um, how uh, you kind of problematize the planet or the globe as as like this the site for your work. Oh, I have. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm just purely fascinated that we are living on a on a sphere, you know. That this is that in Australia you don't fall off, <laughs> and these kind of really stupid things. But still, I think, I mean, we sh I think we are now not straight. You know, we are somehow tilted, and <laughs> yeah, magnetic field, and so. I have to believe it, but there's no so much, not so much um, steel or iron in me that, that it, I don't, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, um, yeah, I'm fascinated by this almost, um, how do you call it, playful, funny thing we are living on, on this sphere, and we are walking on this sphere, and we are all these humans, and it's one space, I mean, these ideas of the, let's say, 50s or 60s, United Nations, there's one parliament in New York, and we all meet, and then we have um, yeah, conventions and, and <clears throat> human rights for the... So I th still think it's fantastic. Um, maybe I'm a little nostalgic about the 50s or 60s, when we still believed in, and we all happily together living on this world. And... Um, yes, and then I'm fascinated how we organize this space. It's just one space. We've just a little bit more or less 200 countries, not a lot. If, if I compare it to a house, 200 rooms, it's now not a huge palace. It's quite a big house, but it's manageable. Um, yeah. That's it. It's very much this fascination with it's just us and this space and we have to deal with it. Also this almost prison-like thing, we cannot escape. I mean, we think we can play, go to the moon or Mars, but not yet. And there's no claustrophobia yet. And yeah, there is now with the virus, it's funny that suddenly things get closed off. Suddenly, I, I think in, in, in the US, you would also suddenly realize that there is a border between Wisconsin and Minnesota. If there would be a lot of virus cases in, let's say, Minnesota, then the other states would suddenly, um, yeah, shut, shut, shut you out or block you or so, and suddenly you see, um, yeah, things appear which you never thought of. Uh, what was I think? No, there was one thing I wanted to say, then I stopped. But it was about, feel like, yeah, I, I, no, I forgot it. But it's, yeah, this, this one space is, is fascinating. Was it related to Sloterdijk's uh, sphere idea? Insideness and sphere? Interior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his sphere idea is very scaleless as well. I like that, and and his, but also this con, this um, thinking in in a, in a historical um, continuity continuity in a way. Also, I mean, he he also um, makes this historical reference of of the sphere and the development of, of the spherical thinking, yeah. I just want to follow up with that. You mentioned, for example, the, I guess some nostalgia that you have for the mid 20th century with the, these like large supranational pro projects, the UN or NATO or League of Nations and the kind of uh, planetary standardization or the idea of planetary community. And you had uh, presented one of your previous works where you kind of were tracing um, 
key moments or, or key instruments in globalization, process of globalization. Um, I'm curious how, based on your, your analysis of, as you, as you say, the past 500 years of globalization, um, how you might characterize um, the most recent phenomena, whether it um, follows this trajectory or do, you, or do you see it kind of much more diffuse and maybe there isn't so much a trajectory um, based on the kinds of things you study of, of um, for example, the, the passports, which are kind of a system of controlling and um, walls, which are another system of controlling um, uh, in contrast to this kind of 20th century period of, of opening up and breaking down walls and so on. No, it, I mean, I see a lot of changes. I mean, I'm not so fascinated by this bureaucratic globalization. You know, I'm more fascinated by the, uh, the popular globalization. That uh, when Michael Jackson died, everybody was sad. I was not a Michael Jackson fan, but I had the feeling the whole world was sad. And that there's a sadness over the whole world. I mean, it's, it's not, it should not participate, but there's a global happiness. When there is uh, the world championship in soccer, I don't know, I mean, most of the people just watch soccer and are hopefully happy for the one who wins. And that's amazing, I think. And that's more what I'm looking for than this. Uh, uh, but I see, for example, I'm fascinated by time, time zones. So I'm now in this time zone. I've never been in that time zone before in my life. So it's a very special moment for me that I'm in this time zone because New York is, is one hour uh, difference. And it's, yeah, it's, and each time zone is almost each uh, 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 earth in itself because you, you are in this time. And if you step over there, you have to reset. So it's very artificial. But I think it could be that in 100 years, we don't have time zones anymore, that we go with the sun again because our devices adjust automatically to, um, I mean, the inventor of the time zone was, um, that was uh, St Stanford Fleming. He was at this uh, 1884 um, conference in Washington and he proposed that 20, the division of the world in 24 equal segments and that you have two clocks, one the local time and one the global time. So that could be, so, so technology, changes probably a lot. And for example, the time to change the time, yeah, would be quite cool. Uh, I was wondering for both of you a question, have you thought about the relationship of knowledge and action or legibility and action? Your work, both of your work is very interesting and compelling. It tells story, it converts raw data, which is not knowledge, I would argue, it's just there, information is out there. We sort of know it, but you tr translate it into something that's legible, and then you sort of produce knowledge. Uh, but what does it do? Have you thought of the, in this making of the world more legible or more understandable through graphics, more accessible, is there a certain action that you want to come after it, or it's not outside of your, uh, scope of ambition. I'm asking this because the school, and usually architecture schools you, today are very action-oriented. This is what I call the should ambition. People are activated to do things to somehow, um, and I think it's good to produce space in which you can think when you don't need to act, you can just step back, give yourself some time and think. Uh, but your work, since it's so sort of self-aware and critical about the way it renders something legible, and also the matter at hand that you study, very uh, controversial, what do you think your work does? This type of theory, what does it do? If, if it is a theory, if it is a story? So, well, to talk about this project in particular, I'd say it really depends how you want to talk about it. Do you want to talk about it as a um, piece of journalism or do you want to talk about it um, as a piece of critical cartography? Um, and I think these are two very different things and they achieve different objectives. Um, critical cartography and counter mappings, the way that, so the way that when I, the way that I talk about this project as opposed to the way that Francesca would talk about this project as journalist. Um, so it's, in, in it's, it's essentially activist, right? Um, 
And journalism is the opposite. Journalism, by definition, cannot be activist. It has to stay as neutral as possible. And so um, to bridge these two was the most interesting part of this project because uh, we engaged in like an activist critical cartography, but at the same time, there's a robust reporting uh, behind this. And so if you talk about this project as a journalistic tool, it was for us the, the most important thing that is newsworthy, that it, there's a story to be told to wider public, to in interested New Yorkers. Um, for me, it was like a moment of how can I engage in, um, in as, a, as a map maker and practitioner um, uh, in the critical cartography. And it's sort of like, it's a, a critical cartography exists in sort of as a piece of theory, but this is very few um, recent examples. It's, we talk about it a lot in design disciplines, and we try to engage in it in some way or the other, but we always resort to um, map projections in which Australia is in the bottom and looks like it's gonna fall. We never question the orientation of the north. Um, we love to use grid on top of a map, turning a sphere into an Excel. Um, why do we use the grid, the grid implies everything is surveyed, everything is, has a coordinate. Um, so I'm interested in sort of like trying to break from these conventions and try to comp like, interested in like different ways of representing ground. Um, so I guess, you know, in, that, was, that was the goal. And perhaps changing the sense of situatedness for whoever is navigating through your map, at the end, it is a navigation device, right? It's mm -hmm. not like a, just a graphic design exercise. Yeah, so map, I'm interested in maps as also as a, a navigational devices. I'm very interested in maps as analytical devices, but also mostly interested in maps as narrative devices and what kind of story map can tell. And the way we can envision the relationship between um, an, a, a storytelling or, or a narrative and map is manifold. So it's... Uh, you can have, you can use a map to tell a story, right? That would be like the typical um, journalism piece. Like the, the, the maps we see in New York Times are usually those that are trying to like, you know, tell a story, what happened where. Uh, but there, you can also use a map and look at the map and construct your own story. Um, that's rarely mentioned, but for example, uh, you know, Ulysses is written that way. There was a, uh, um, a map of Dublin that was on the, that was constantly in the back of that of that piece. The novel was written looking at the map, but map never exists there. And then there's also a moment like what I showed here is that we can construct a narrative from the whole process. So map itself is not the most important thing. It's the survey, compilation, design, and circulation, and the story of the of of, the, of that whole process. Um. What about you, Theo? Have you thought about the action and legibility, or is it outside uh, of the scope? Yeah, well, I think architects are very blessed with the ability to create drawings that a lot of people understand. And we have to, I mean, that's why I'm very much in favor of, um, how do you say that? Uh, basic study of the boring architecture, the, the very traditional architecture education in the very beginning, and to not start too early with conceptual design or so. Because to learn just to draw a plan that the plumber and the carpenter understands. That's our thing. If, the, if they are on the building side, they have no clue what, what, what the, what's there, then the whole design doesn't make sense. So we have to translate our ideas for a very general public. And then we have also competitions. Then we have even to, to explain this idea to a mayor who is not able to, to read plans like a plumber. A plumber is quite educated already. But the mayor, yeah, so <laughs> they just look, at, but it should be a cool design. Or, so we have to translate our ideas, ideas constantly to a, to a large audience. And I think that makes it easier also for us to, to draw maps which are then understandable. I, for, I'm kind I of think curious so. about what you think about uh, how we should approach legibility 
because I feel like in the data visualization, um, there are like two approaches that are currently um, trending. One is like to be as legible as possible to as wider possible audience. But there's another one uh, that like you try to construct uh, complicated drawing so that a user engages with it. And that it's not uh, immediately um, obvious. And, and that in some way challenges notions of of preconceived maybe you know notions of something and so we were a little bit interested in that too I don't know I didn't talk about it for the project but I don't if you remember in the home page we had these like little data portraits of each canner that were like circular little drawings and we worked with uh, Francesca um, with uh, Georgia Lupi who is a, a um, data humanist and information designer uh, who helped us develop these because we wanted to like do something weird that you can't really figure like it's opposite of simple and it's like you have to sort of like engage with that little drawing and the legend for a little while and, and start to construct the story of who this person is and in that way um, sort of challenge the preconceived notions of, of what they look like. Because we had canners that are old, that are young, that identify as male, female, gender, queer, um, and sort of and like how to construct a complicated drawing that, that reveals all of that, but you need to like slowly read into it. I think that's not enough, that like we're, we're trying to go too much into legibility and sort of forgetting this sort of idea of um, engaging with the drawing. Um, yeah. No, I totally understand what you mean. And um, I think, yeah, it's, it's not, I think it's both is, is valid. I think that I'm mostly going for the legibility. I mean, my latest book, The uh, Atlas of, um, The Ultimate Atlas is, is the opposite. So it's, it's non-legible. Non can show it later, but and it takes it, it's surprising me myself because I'm very impatient. If I don't understand mm -hmm. things, I just throw them away. So that's why <laughs> I think pff, mostly I say, ah, stupid, don't understand it, which is completely shows how stupid I am uh, it, at this moment because you really should have time and should engage. Um, my new book is is a book I would just look at and throw away, which is. Every time I see it, I think, how, how could I make that? But there is, I think there are, so I would never, I appreciate it really. Um, there is a, a French office, it's called Bureau de Tut, I think, or mm -hmm. so. They, they are making beautiful maps, but you really need hours to spend mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. them. And I really appreciate them because I would, could never do that, what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I want to open up to the audience. Hopefully we catalyzed enough sort of things in your brains right now. Questions are bubbling. Um, any, any first responses? Yeah, go on. So another kind of like duality in the architectural world and design is kind of the contrast between globalization, which you've been talking about, Theo, and being having like a local focus or emphasis. Um, how can you see, you know, as architects, our responsibility to like hold both of those, or how should they interact? Yeah, I think what, what I like about the local, like, like the international style was, I think, ignoring climate, for example. So that we build in Algiers, like in Stockholm. And I think the, the local contribution is, 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 for me, that the strongest local contribution is climate. Then there are um, skills. We have uh, wood countries and stone countries almost. I mean, the, for, and, and I know in, in the Anglo, let's say in, in United Kingdom, they are very good in steel and glass and so, while the Scandinavian countries are very good with wood. Um, and, and local skills one should also embrace. 
we should not say that they always should stay with their skills, but if there are skills already, one should not ignore them, ignore them. or if there are resources. Uh, like in Scandinavia or Austria, it's full. I, 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 most architecture I do is, is in Austria, and all my buildings are wood buildings, because there's very good new, um, it's laminated timber, perfect material, it's almost like, yeah, like concrete, it comes in, the biggest dimensions are 24 by three and a half meter, and you just cut out whatever you want put them together, it's, it's fantastic material, has super insulation uh, values. So that's what I would say is this global, local, um, what changed in the last, where, where I'm very happy about it, that it changed. I have a question about navigation. Um, in Gabriel's class we read a text by Patricia Reed that described navigation as um, a synthetic operation between the conceptual and material, um, but now the computation does some of that synthesis for you. Um, I'm talking specifically about like Google Maps and how like my dad would always say like, no one knows their way around, they just follow the Siri. Um, but it seems to me that you both use, I mean, technology to aid your work. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak about the computational aspects um, of navigation, thinking about it. So I think uh, I have strong feelings about uh, Google Maps. I, am, um, I see myself as a blue dot. I'm obsessed with it. I'm a total geocontrol freak. Even if I know exactly where I am, I need to look at it. I can't help it. Uh, and I feel like it represents a totally paradigmatic shift in which the maps are, are uh, accepted as reality. Um, what we see on a Google Maps is basically reality. And, um, but it's, uh, and we forget how curated that is for us. Like what you see on what Zoom level is like carefully you know, decided for you. Um, and yeah, so uh, I engage in the, those tools constantly. I just feel like uh, well, we are no, not critical enough in about how that technology is influencing us. Um, but yeah, I'm a blue dot. <laughs> Would you uh, expand on the notion of navigation broadly, not just navigation geographically and cartographically, but through your work is helping us to navigate through the policy and legal uh, articulation of spatial constraints, right? Was it, was it part of the intent? Is would you qualify it as a navigation device? The Handbook of Tyranny is a very provocative title, as if like a tyrant needs a handbook. <laughs> Hopefully not, yeah. How would, no. we, how would we navigate the world with your book? I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, very, it's a very specific section yeah. um, of the world. The world is much richer. This is one uh, view on it, which sometimes becomes stronger and weaker uh, with events and, and mm. happenings. Yeah, it's, it's one particular view. But it's anyway, with, with maps, I really liked your work also, and, and that you, you show a very specific um, situation or, or life, um, and that's, yeah, that's interesting and, and it's valuable, I think. But I never thought about the Zoom levels, that it's very accurate, but it's logical, yeah, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but, going yeah? off of what Mohan asked about policy, like, do you seem like you do a lot of uh, research into like the context of walls, like specifically the water walls, and and like that's kind of absent in the mapping, um, where you like you have this like world map where you mapped all like all the existing walls and existing border walls, and you have them as a line, and and it's kind of assuming that it's serving the same purpose on both sides of that line, where it's it's not 
it's, it's benefited on one side, and it's definitely created to protect one side from the other. And I, like, I wonder if you can show that context in a map where you can show um, like one side is like great out because that side is like negatively being impacted by that wall, and the other side that builds that wall. Mm. Yeah, this is in the the legend. Uh, the first mentioned country is the one who built the wall in the legend. So we have US Mexican wall, USA Mexico, and in the legend there's a little um, explanation. The first mentioned uh, country was the one who built the wall. We even had in the first issue a mistake. So we, yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah. And I think in the drawings we put the soldier on the side of the wall builder, so in the section, because the sections are not always symmetrical. Yeah, and there's always a soldier and a civilian in the section on, one, on the, each side. These are the small yeah, methods you have, but I like the level of details you can uh, put into uh, a work. Because it's a very good question or a good thought when you think, yeah, we also thought, how can we show that? And that was a way how we can sh could show it. I guess I'm curious, I'm just going off of this question. You, you, in your presentation, you were fairly dispassionate about um, what you were showing us. And uh, I'm curious more about the, like, what was the motivation for the book? and um, you know, what, what do you hope the, for your typical reader of it, whether it's the Ephraim or the nav navigation, but um, what, would, yeah, what was your motivation behind the work and behind the research and behind all the mapping and everything? Um, yeah, the, the, the basic motivation is to show, to show global events, to, to cause, as I said, we, we have somehow have education to, 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 to uh, make drawings which are understandable by a broader audience. And I always um, I, yeah, I have this urge to, to see it and to share it. Just to share these, yeah, these designs and, and in the drawings, um, I think it's always good to stay as neutral as possible, but in the text there is always a, an opinion then. Yeah. The, uh, I guess the pro, maybe more what Connor's getting at, is why, why tyranny? Why take, you know, something that you call sub as dispassionate, but something that's very emotional and sort of spatialized that? Mm -hmm. Like, what was, why, why not something else? I mean, there, there is, a, I'm, I'm doing it since 15 or years or longer. And there were some, like the flight information regions or the global uh, columns. Um, th this is earlier work, which is more colorful and more, yeah, let's, le let's say less tyrannical. But this was the, la the, the work of the last five, six years where we concentrated especially on that topic. And it was a, a specific choice but it also had to do with events after 2008. I think uh, after the first impact we had was 2001, but 2008, nine, somehow the world changed radically in a, in a I don't know, in a, in, a, in a less free way. It was kind of a gut feeling of, of there's something changing. There's some, yeah, walls appearing, hinders appearing. Uh, um, Let's say, weirdly enough, I always called the whole work snapshots of globalization, and I was always a little bit ashamed because uh, to be fascinated in globalization, was all, I was always criticized because globalization was considered as something bad. Suddenly now, uh, because we have entered, the anti-globalization move, uh, movement has people like Trump, Suddenly we understand that it was not so bad. I mean, there were good things happening through globalization. 
and I always was propagating the cultural globalization, never the bureaucratic or, or, or capitalistic. Yeah. I mean, I can sort of help you generate new questions in terms of uh, the notion of reassurance, because there are multiple architectures that reassure the normalcy, the border wall being one of them, protocols of entry and exit being another one. And at the end of the day, we are not, we are, we're not just building buildings, that's not what we are tasked to. We are uh, making ideas, making concepts, although you're not in favor of that, perhaps he said, uh, you're in favor of very basic architectural education. I, I'm very, work very conceptual, but yeah. I think if you... In terms of skills, you mean? In terms of skill, yeah. if first there should be um, the, the knowledge what is a wall and column, that two columns have to be on top of each other in the next level yeah. and so, that forces have to go from the roof till the basement, these logical architectural mm -hmm. things before right. that first and then conceptual. Because right. just to avoid that we become, I, I, I'm a little bit nostalgic to the Renaissance man. I have right. the feeling we should all be a little bit of model makers and a little bit 3D model. And we should also know how to calculate a column at least. And, but is uh, that the architecture that exists now? Do you think that's what reassur what's reassuring without those sort of, I mean, you-, you I don't know, are, it's very personal. I mean, the, everybody can do it if you, if you want. You can be very broad, uh, but I, also it's, I, mean, I don't know, it's very personal. I also think if somebody is a model maker, it's fantastic. I also, I love my model maker. He, he's very good and very nerdish about the models. But probably he also has a knowledge because he's educated as an architect. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't want to offend anybody who is now very specialized in something. But for me personally, I love the broadness of the profession. Let's say. Broadness that you, broadness that you sort of, uh, is, is rooted in very conventional knowledge of architecture, it seems to be. Because there is, yeah. there is a con very critical conceptual story that you're telling about architecture that's not just buildings, it is policy, it is legal frameworks, legal encasements. It is an architecture that is invisible, quite spatial, even more so than buildings themselves. But you're using very conventional language of just sections to uh, depict that, make it legible. So, and that way, just a demonstration for you that architectural knowledge doesn't have to be translated into buildings necessarily. That's, that's just the idea, to give you ideas what to do, you know. Um, I still am wait, I'm waiting for more curiosity from you, <laughs> otherwise I'll <laughs> go on. So I'll address the easy part first. Um, there's no compensation involved. It's not allowed. <laughs> you can't, journalists not, don't compensate 
you know, the you know, people who they interview. Um, the point is you give someone a platform to talk, right? Um, and in oral history in particular, um, there's even no hierarchy between an interviewer and interviewee. So you start with a very simple and broad question. Tell me about relationship with your mother and and you start talking. So the so so we were very, very careful so not to 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 sort of like not have that hierarchy so to be comp to so this is like we were constantly reminding ourselves this is co-owned project we all own this together this is not my project your project this is we all are authors here um and it was very empowering sometimes we were both we we both thought we might want to compensate. We wanted to, like, you know, you see someone doesn't have sho shoes to can, and you want to give someone a shoes, you need to stop. Like, journalistic ethics tells you you cannot do that. So we had to, be, I didn't know that, but I learned that through this project. So the best you can give it is to, like, not have hierarchy and just, like, purely give someone an empowering tool of platform to speak, tell their story. Um, so that was our guiding principle for this. Um, and then, of course, everything else you said, keeping privacy, we did not put the real names. We, those are pseudonyms, um, not re revealing what they look like, um, and things like that, yeah. But it's crazy, because like, um, for some of these canners, this has been, even though they haven't been compensated, for some of them, that's been like a really amazing experience. No one's ever asked someone to tell their story. And we have like, for one Kenner, we have like 30 hours of recording of stories, how the person came, walked from Ecuador on foot. I mean, it's just amazing, uh, the things. And it takes time. The time is the, of essence. You cannot come and just expect that you're going you're gonna to get a story from someone quickly. Um, it took a year to build this kind of relationship in which we thought we are all you know, the same. Um, Francesca, at the end, because she was the one who had to walk with them, was con considered as one of the canners at the end of this project. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, does, does that still feel, does it feel like equal though? Like that, that, sure, you've given them this platform, um, but they're not going to get um, a residency anymore that for being part of this You know, like there's still a little bit of an imbalance. No, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, we always start, yeah. I mean, already if you say, Already, I shouldn't even say, you give someone a platform, starts with the idea, I'm with, in a position of power to give someone a platform. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it still feel, it feels right, yeah. I mean, the, the question, I've, I've had questions like this about this project all the time, of, um, about time and compensation and whether, you know, what. You use them for your research, even I've got accused uh, once. Um, and you're telling someone who spends a year volunteering at the, <laughs> at the redemption center <laughs> that they're <laughs> using canners for, it's, it's kind of uh, ironic, but okay. Um, um, I can, yeah, it feels, it, well, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just like there's, <coughs> there's such a, for me, like there's such an opportunity to 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 relook at like that exploration or like to re, to relook at this like like journalism. You can't compensate people. Like that's just that's just no. You, you can't. know, like we can definitely. Like, there's so much room for reform. And there's so much room for and like the architecture can do that. That you have now like rendered this this system visible and that like that it needs fixing. That we can't just exploit marginalized people for their stories and then compensate for them. Well, it benefits the people who are asking the questions much more. You know, I don't know. I think what the work does uh, is uh, affirms the equality of intelligence between, regardless of your status, which is the, uh, 
uh, which is the notion of democracy, it is based on the idea of equality of intelligence. There's always inequality, economically speaking. It's not that we are all animated to um, fix every issue, including economics, though you're raising a great point, actually. But there's an essential nuance here, which this kind of work, uh, not by giving platform, maybe that's not the best way to word it, but uh, affirming the equality of intelligence amongst the citizens. We're all citizens, we have voice, and our interpretations of the world are valid, regardless of our economic status, uh, and they have the right to participate in the making of the common sense. Uh, the map constructs uh, common sense, and in Hannah Arendt's notion of common sense, being in public, uh, being a political actor. So uh, empowering then occurs on the level of uh, thinking of the mapping perhaps as a way to generate political uh, platform for them, which maybe it was outside of the scope. But what was compelling for me for, the, for this, uh, it's a great point, again, all of the inequalities that are revealed uh, that we don't feel, but in, even in Theo's case, Afghanistan being completely walled off, that's an inequality. Are we here in the West concerned about uh, that? We are at the end occupying, mm -hmm. our footprint is not just a little, we cannot be as provincial as just, just thinking about solving the issues here, no? Footprint, as you showed, the German, German footprint. I guess the US footprint is larger than that. So we are essentially global citizens our ethics is uh, of a global citizen, not just provincial, right? Um, You're just complicating the yeah, discussion. I'm really um, curious about your um, thinking towards the future. Um, I went to an event about ethics over lunch with Tom Fisher. It's actually Ethics Week, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, but Tom Fisher was talking about um, the pre-industrial revolution idea of ethic, which was being good. And then post-industrial revolution up to the contemporary time is doing good. So being good is like virtue, and then doing good is like a sort of um, creation. But I, I wonder, I like how you questioned like, is it time to revisit these ethics? Because that is like John Stuart Mill, like Bentham, all of these old dudes. And so what is the ethic of the 21st century? And I, I think um, that's a really interesting question when we're talking about emergency and reassurance, because those questions uh, have a sort of like violence and um, there's a, a combative part of it. And it, I think ethics is a really good question to bring up. Yeah, and in a way maps take away the exculpatory element. You know, now you have to act. Uh, there's a exculpatory sort of it reduces, redeems you of your guilt if you, you can say, I didn't know that, right? Or, uh, or if you're forced to act in a certain way, you were under uh, pressure to act in a certain way, in an amoral way, you have some sort of exculpatory window. In a way, then the legibility that's created through the, these maps is intervening quite uh, violently into the ethical. It's just a discussion I wonder if we can I want to bring Gabriel in. I mean, we've been talking. Gabriel has been silent. Do you want any, any final sort of questions? Honestly, I, the thing that um, I'm, I'm just trying to constellate a bunch of different thoughts, but I think, Vahan, how you began and also um, um, interjected in the middle was about architecture, not as building, but as a way of a kind of system of mobilizing documents. Um, but nevertheless, we are educated through a relatively conventional system where documentation of buildings is the main thing. And I'm curious um, um, in your teaching or in, in, in how you think about like the basic architectural knowledge, now that the architect has splintered into these many different um, specialists, is there a kind of um, knowledge that carries through consistently in them, or is each one develop, creating its own sub-discipline? And um, I guess if, if young, young uh, architects want to um, carry forward and, and deal with all sorts of spatial material matters, 
um, what sort of um, um, approaches or ways of thinking or skills, if I could say, um, come in handy when you're doing the work that you do, which seems so distant maybe from like the to standard designing a building, drawing the building? I, I don't have a good answer to that because I, and I, can't, I even can't uh, explain to my parents uh, why am I not doing architecture, even though I'm trained as an architect? <laughs> and to me, it seems so natural where I am right now. <laughs> but it's, you're right, it's so removed from drawing buildings or making, you know, designing buildings. Um, um, I still feel this is a spatial practice. And, yeah. and so, yeah. So it's, a, it's somehow a sensibility of interpreting, documenting spatial phenomena. Exactly, yeah, mm, spatial patterns. But I yeah. think you would probably not be able to do what you do if you would not be educated as an architect. I mean, we cannot know because... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it is, the edu to be educated as an architect, yeah, I'm very fascinated by that because it, it opens doors to so many things. And I'm, what I was talking about, this almost traditional education, is, sorry, is not that one should then work in that, but that it, just that creates the full ability to become the whole full, full range and to let architecture go. But yeah. this, the knowledge about space as architect, you walk through New York and you know exactly, okay, these are the columns. You, you know the whole city theoretically, how it, how it is grounded. But it's, yeah, quite something. Yeah, in my personal experience, my architectural education has been, uh, been the most formative years, but architectural practice, least formative years. Um, that sounds terrible for <laughs> yeah. uh, not right now, <laughs> but um, yeah. So that's why I'm still at the school of art, <laughs> making maps. <laughs> Answer questions to three of you. Uh, you're all sort of speaking about storytelling. Given your teaching is somewhat about storytelling, but you are telling architectural stories. I would argue because you are. T telling critical spatial stories and unwittingly you end up engaging architectural concepts. So the language is there. You cannot completely divorce yourself from the architectural metaphor or from the uh, architecture in a most conventional way of it. So have you ever thought about what makes the story architectural? Given you are architects, you're telling stories. Uh, have you like ever conceptualized that part of your work? <clears throat> Honestly, not, not really. <laughs> um, yeah. I suppose it is somewhat, it, it is situated within the discourse, maybe it speaks to the discourse, as you said, of critical cartography, which speaks to the design tradition and the ways we use language in schools. It is somewhat a storytelling in that way, speaking to the audience of architects, maybe. So yeah. one thing that sort of drives me it's like the way that um, there's like a particular way that architects use maps, um, and it comes in form of a site map. And it, I find it annoying the way that like site maps always look the same. Um, they always just shows building footprint and maybe maybe like um, public transportation. There's very little engagement in. Um, the agency of mapping to tell more powerful story about the site. Um, and so that's where, through this process, I was like, just, can, we just, can we just break that pattern and try to like, do something else? Um, that's maybe the moment that sort of like, got me to go into that direction where I am now, um, making like, weird maps that don't really look like maps. Um, what about you, Theo? I mean, your work sort of foregrounds elements of space as active agents, like walls. Walls are like, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the term? They're like alive 
you render inanimate objects as like active speakers of the story. Is it, is it what it makes an architectural story or just some other things? Or is it not an architectural story at all? It's just journalistic. No, I think it's architects, yeah, talk most about space. Yeah. And space is, yeah, I, yeah, in, in English it's even outer space. So it's very, it's uh, scaleless. And architects just always talk about space. And I think the, the narrative which binds it together is, yeah, the spatial aspect. But I never thought about it. I mean, how it relates, but I'm just saying now also. But I think it's, yeah, it's always about space. And always somehow a three dimension. It's probably what I realized there's a big difference between uh, graphic designers and architects, funny enough. And what I realized is the biggest fights are between graphic designers and architects. And I think this is the 2D, 3D conflict. Mm -hmm. I could imagine. Yeah. That's why people say, yeah, you're a designer. I say, no, I'm, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm very bad in graphic design. But, or bad, but it's not, I don't know. I, I, yeah, it's not my thing. It belongs in a, in a different different field, and they are yeah, fantastic yeah. graphic designers, and I really appreciate what they are doing, but I cannot do it. I'm bad in it. So it, what makes it architectural is that it's not a graphic design. I don't know. <laughs> I, it's, to me, it's a mystery why I'm so bad in graphic design. I, I cannot do these lines, which don't make, don't make sense. A line is either a street or a wall or anything, but they suddenly they, they make a line, and I think, you make this line, <laughs> and then they indeed make this line makes it beautiful. It's fantastic, and but I'm too much into this. Yeah. <laughs> Gabriel, any uh, any your idea of architectural story? What would that be, given your practice and territory, and you know, some of the key words that you use. I mean, I, I think. Uh, Spaces, I agree, space, but I think also material somehow, and whether it's cans or it's mm -hmm. chunks of stone that assemble to make a wall, I think um, there's also a uh, fascination with material world. Yeah. I mean, it's an open-ended discussion, so hopefully we started. If you, if you have more questions, then we succeeded now. <laughs> All right, uh, we're done with the time, right? We have until 5.30. Thank you for your attention and thank you to our panelists.